agriculture. So we're going to talk a little bit first about what the paleo diet is, what are its characteristics, how modern foods differ from the foods that we are genetically adapted to. And then after we get into that, I'm going to be showing you how certain foods, our research group believes, are intimately tied to the development of multiple sclerosis and how by eliminating these foods, particularly in people that have <coughs> Uh, relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis can benefit uh, by changing their diet. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about multiple sclerosis. I realize that we probably have some people here with the disease, people with relatives that may have the disease, or people that have other autoimmune diseases and might be interested in our model. So. The bottom line with multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune meaning that the body's own immune system attacks its own tissues. And in the case of multiple sclerosis, it attacks a covering surrounding nerves called the myelin sheath. All right? So the immune system is attacking the myelin sheath. And when it destroys the myelin sheath, the myelin sheath can heal itself, i.e. remission, but quite often it doesn't heal itself and we continue to develop plaques and these plaques then prevent the normal transmission of electrical signals from the central nervous system either the spine or the brain to the muscles okay and so that's a, a hallmark then of the symptoms that we see in multiple sclerosis It doesn't take rocket science. Most of you can deduce that the types of foods that you see up here in the middle clearly would not have been available to our pre-agricultural ancestors. And the way they ate their food was they gathered it and they hunted it, they fished it, and it was minimally processed. They really didn't store things. There was no such thing as refrigerators. They had to get up and move around about every two weeks. So storage was not part of the deal. You got the food and you pretty much ate it. If you look in this uh, picture here, those in the front, um, I think this is kind of a cool picture. These are hunter-gatherers um, that lived in Africa <clears throat> up until, they were hunter-gatherers up until probably the late 60s, early 70s. These are the Ikum <laughs> people, and these are Richard Lee's photographs of these people um, taken during that time period in the late 60s. And this woman right here, you can see, this is her bounties that she's got from gathering foods. And we see something here that looks kind of like a modern-day watermelon. This actually is... Uh, a watermelon, uh, but much, much smaller. And you can see there's some roots in here and some nuts and some berries. And right here in the middle, this is a tortoise. So she actually got a tortoise in her, in her gatherings, and she brought this back. And this fellow has got himself a, a nice <coughs> bloody mammal. So why couldn't pre-agricultural people, why couldn't hunter-gatherers normally have eaten cereal grains? Well, the first thing is, if you look at cereal grains, they're small, at least in the wild. They're very <clears throat> difficult to harvest, and unless you cook them and grind them up, you can't digest them. Now, these are foods that are Neolithic foods, meaning that they are introduced during that agricultural period. And we believe that these foods are intimately tied to the development of multiple sclerosis. Now, when you first look up here, it's like, yeah, give me a break. Beans, you know, bread, tomatoes, peanuts, milk. It's like, wait a minute, is this science or is this snake oil? So what I'll try to do is I will try over the course of the next half hour to 35 minutes to show you the molecular basis of how these foods are involved in the induction of multiple sclerosis. So, in a nutshell then, these are the foods that I recommend, our research group rec recommends for modern people trying to follow a Stone Age diet. Clearly you can't be a hunter-gatherer again, but you certainly can go to the supermarket and make healthful choices, choices that eliminate two food groups, grains and dairy. And in your handouts, I noticed that Ashton included one of our papers showing the nutritional adequacy. Many of you think, my God, what's going to happen? How am I going to get my calcium if I eliminate milk? What's going to ha how am I going to get my fiber if I eliminate bread? L read the paper that's included in the handout, and you'll see that when you eat a diet that's composed just of these foods, it's actually nutritionally way more dense than a diet that has those <coughs> refined foods in it.